26. Acts chapter number 26, if you would, is where is where we are. We're gonna we've been going through uh, the book of Acts for nearly a year now. We've just been going through it, and it's really surprising. It, honestly, I think I've said this several times. That it doesn't seem like it's been that long as when we've been going through the book of Acts. But Acts chapter number 26 is where we are at. We're going to read the first 23 verses uh, of the chapter. I understand that if you're not physically able, but if you are physically able, out of honor and respect for reading of God's word, let's all stand, shall we? And then we'll get into the reading and preaching of God's word. (laughs) Acts chapter number 26. The Bible says, verse number 1, says, Then Agrippa said unto Paul, Thou art permitted to speak for thyself. Then Paul stretched forth the hand and answered for himself, I think, my, I think myself happy, King Agrippa, because I shall answer for myself this day before thee, touching all the things whereof I am accused of the Jews, especially because I know thee to be, an, uh, to be expert in all customs and questions which are among the Jews, wherefore I beseech thee to hear me patiently. My manner of life from my youth, which was at the first among mine own nation at Jerusalem, know all the Jews, which knew me from the beginning, if they would testify that after the most straightest sect of our religion, I lived a Pharisee. And now I stand and am judged for the hope of the promise made of God unto our fathers, unto which promise our twelve tribes instantly serving God day and night hope to come, for which hope's sake... King Agrippa, I am accused of the Jews. Why should it be thought a thing incredible with you that God should raise the dead? I verily thought with myself that I ought to do many things contrary to the name of Jesus of Nazareth, which thing I did I also did in Jerusalem, and many of the saints did I shut up in prison, and having received authority from the chief priests when they were put to death, I gave my voice against them. And I punished them oft in every synagogue, And compelled them to blaspheme, and being exceedingly mad against them, I persecuted them even unto strange cities. Whereupon, as I went to Damascus with authority and commission from the chief priests, at midday, O king, I saw in the way a light from heaven, above the brightness of the sun, shining round about me and them which journeyed with me. And when we were all fallen to the earth, I heard a voice speaking unto me and saying in the Hebrew tongue, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? It is hard for thee to kick against the pricks. And I said, Who art thou, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus, whom thou persecutest. But rise and stand upon thy feet, and I have appeared unto thee for this purpose, to make thee a minister and a witness, both of these things which thou hast seen, and of those things which thou wilt appear unto thee, delivering thee from the people and from the Gentiles unto whom I now send thee, to open their eyes, And to turn them from darkness to light, and from the power of Satan unto God, that they may receive forgiveness of sins and inheritance among them which are sanctified by faith that is in me. Whereupon, O King Agrippa, I was not disobedient unto the the heavenly vision, but showed first unto them of Damascus and at Jerusalem and throughout all the coast of Judea, and then to the Gentiles, that they should repent and turn to God and do works meet for repentance." For these causes the Jews caught me in the temple and went went about to kill me. Having therefore obtained help of God, I continue unto this day, witnessing both to small and great, saying none other things than those which the prophets and Moses did say should come, that Christ should suffer, that he should be the first that should rise from the dead and should show light unto the people and to the Gentiles. And we'll stop there. This morning's message is entitled, Hope Has Come. Hope Has Come. Let's pray. Father, Lord, we thank you for this uh, morning that you've given us. Lord, I'm thankful, Lord, for uh, our our guests that are able to be here this morning. Father, I'm thankful, Lord, that we are able to assemble here, Lord, with freedom. And I pray, dear God, that you would meet with us, Lord, in a great way. Father, I need you. Lord, I need your help. Lord, we... I understand this, Lord, and I pray that the task that is before me, Lord, that it would be accomplished, Lord, by the leading of your Spirit. Lord, I pray that your people, Father, that would have open ears and open hearts, dear God, and as your word goes forth, Lord, I trust that you would just do a great and mighty work. Lord, we're thankful for your goodness. We're thankful for your love and mercy. Lord, we ask these things that you be with us now in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Thank you. You may be seated. 
You know, to kind of, kind of gather a context of what's kind of taking place here in the passage, uh, this is the, Paul is standing in front of a third person to try to figure out what charges they could come up with against Paul. This is, this is the third person. The first person that he stood in front of was a governor by the name of Felix. And there were some hostile Jews, some hostile religious Jews that one of the apostle Paul killed. And, and Felix, he couldn't find anything to charge Paul with because he was innocent. And so the Bible says to please the hostile crowd, he, he, kept, he kept Paul in, Cis, in Caesarea, kept him bound in, in a jail cell. And then for two years, that's where they left him. And then uh, Felix, uh, he kind of falls off the scene. And then there's a new governor by the name of Festus. And Festus comes in as the new governor, and, and he reopens the case with the Apostle Paul, and kind of trying to figure out, hey, why are you here, and what, can, what are you being charged with? And, and it's a lot of the same story here. The, the, the hostile Jews had no new evidence that they could bring up against Paul. They had nothing new that they could uh, charge him with. And so what Festus does is that he's, he doesn't know what to charge Paul with. And so what he does is that he invites a... A, a fellow companion, and his name is Agrippa. Agrippa. And so here we see in our passage here that Paul, he is standing before Agrippa because Festus says, hey, th these are matters of more Jewish and you might have a greater understanding of what's taking place here. And so we see in verse number two that Paul, he is happy to stand before Agrippa. Look at your Bibles, verse two, it says, I think myself happy, King Agrippa, because I shall answer for myself this day before thee, touching all the things whereof I am accused of the Jews. He says, hey, I'm glad I'm able to stand before you to tell you what, what I'm being accused of here. Verse 3, he says, especially because I know thee to be expert in all customs and questions which are among the Jews, wherefore I beseech thee to hear me patiently. Hey, Paul's happy, and he says, hey, I'm glad I, I get to stand before you, Agrippa. Yeah, Paul isn't brown-nosing here. Yeah, he's not sucking up. That's not what he's doing. But he says, hey, I'm glad I'm able to stand before you because I know you're an expert in, in the, the Jewish customs, in the Jewish law. Basically, he's saying this, hey, I, I know that you are familiar with the Old Testament. I know you're, old, you're familiar with the Old Testament law and the Old Testament prophecy there. And then what Paul begins to do is he begins to bring up his reputation during his upbringing. In verse number four, he says, my manner of life from my youth, which was at the first among mine own nation at Jerusalem, know all the Jews. He's saying, hey, ever since I was a boy, ever since I was a, a youth, people knew who I was. And, and if you study the life of Saul of Tarsus, which who that is, before he was the apostle Paul, he was Saul of Tarsus. And Saul of Tarsus, as even in his youth, people were looking at him and thinking, wow, this is a new up and coming rabbi. I mean, he is a disciple of Gamaliel there and, and one of the high priests and and he would have been considered a, a young man of promise. So, I, I mean, you can, you can just imagine a young man who it seems like he's got all the answers. It seems like he's got his act together. And all the, the religious leaders are looking at this young Saul of Tarsus. And they're thinking, wow, this guy's got great potential. This young man has huge potential as a Pharisee. And then verse 5 says, which knew me from the beginning, if they would testify... After the most straightest sect of our religion, I lived a Pharisee. So here's Paul, and he's speaking to Agrippa. He's speaking about his youth. He says, hey, everybody knew who I was. Everybody th thought I had great potential. And then he goes on to say that, hey, I was of the most straightest sect of our religion. I lived a Pharisee. I mean, Saul of Tarsus was a Pharisee of the Pharisees. That's who he was. And then he went on... It, it, he would be known, he was known for how determined he would be to holding the Mosaic law. Uh, they would have known that Paul would have studied the law and the prophets. Can I say it this way? He was a committed Jew. That's who he was. He was a committed Jew, Judaistic to the core. That's who Saul of Tarsus was. So it sounds like, considering his upbringing, those hostile religious leaders, if they would consider Paul's upbringing, it seems like they would not have a problem with the Apostle Paul. It, so it would seem. So what Paul is telling Agrippa, he's about to tell Agrippa the charges that are held against him as he's standing before them. And this is what Paul conveys. Paul conveys that the charges that are against him are for sharing the hope 
that had come into the world for all people. Those are the charges that are being held against him for sharing the hope that had come into the world. Look at your Bibles, verse number six. Look there if you would. This is Paul speaking to Agrippa. He says, And now I stand and am judged for the hope of the promise made of God unto our fathers. He, he's saying, hey, the hope that I'm referring to is a, is a hope that, our, that God had promised to our forefathers and that that hope would eventually come. This hope was a, was a hope that the 12 tribes of Israel, they were waiting for. Th this hope was a, was a hope that distinguished the Jewish people from every other nation. Th it was a hope, this was a hope that the Jewish nation was to be a light for all other nations. It was, uh, let me put it this way, it was a hope for every Hebrew woman that they would pray that they would give birth to. That was their hope. Well, what is the hope? What hope is he referring to? Well, the hope that God would send the Messiah into the world to redeem people from the power and penalty of sin. That was the hope, that God would send the Messiah. Now look at verse, verse 7. The second part of verse 7 says, For which hope's sake, King Agrippa, I'm accused of the Jews. Now when Paul used that word hope, King Agrippa, I mean, considering to be an expert of the Old Testament, no, for sure, Agrippa would have, have kind of had an idea of what Paul was implying or what Paul was talking about. He, he, and he knew that the Apostle Paul most likely was referring to the Lord Jesus Christ. He most likely would have known that he was referring to the one who was born in Bethlehem. He most likely would have known that he was referring to the one who who was crucified. And he would have known that Paul was referring to the one who had, that he believed Paul had resurrected. Now Agrippa probably was still a little skeptical about the resurrection itself. But I, I, the reason why I believe that is because what Paul says in verse 8. He says, why should it be thought a thing incredible with you that God should raise the dead? He says, hey Agrippa, you're an expert in the Old Testament, right? Hey, hey King Agrippa, you believe God created the heavens and the earth, right? You believe in Genesis 1-1, right? Hey, you believe that God parted the Red Sea? You, you believe that, don't you? And, and, and obviously, and then it's like Paul is saying, hey, why do you think it's incredible that God would raise the dead? Why, why would you think that it would be an incredible thing that God would raise the dead? Hey, I like this quote. Listen to this. A God who cannot raise the dead is a God too small. <laughs> I like that. I don't post anything on Facebook, but I'm really tempted to post that one. <laughs> a God who cannot raise the dead is a God too small. Now, Agrippa, he, do, he doesn't say anything. He, he has nothing to say. I mean, the Bible doesn't record that he said anything, so we can't say that he did or did not say anything. But the Apostle Paul, he carries on with his defense. I mean, he, and Paul gives his personal testimony. Verses 9 through 11. Verse 9 says, I verily thought my, with, it, with myself... I ought to do many things contrary to the name of Jesus of Nazareth. Hey, whatever what was done in Jesus' name, Paul was against it. Whatever was done in Jesus' name, Paul was not for it. He says, not only in Nazareth, but in Jerusalem as well. I, I mean, he goes on to speak about how he shut up the saints in prison and that he would testify against those who were sentenced to death and that they, Paul would give his consent to that. And he would go into the synagogue and, and punish believers and force them, force them to blaspheme Christ. Hey, I know America's not perfect, but I'm so thankful that we don't have uh, officials coming in here and forcing us to blaspheme the name of Christ. Yeah. I'm very, very thankful for that. He had a rage against believers, Saul of Tarsus did. Verse 11, the second part there, it says, And being exceedingly mad against them, I persecuted unto strange cities. Paul had, or at that time, Saul of Tarsus had such a hatred for believers, had such a hatred for Christ, that he would go into different cities and foreign lands just to persecute and to hurt the name of Jesus. So this is what he, this is the conversation that he's having with Agrippa. Agrippa, this is where I was in my youth. In my youth, 
everyone thought I was promising. In my youth, everyone probably thought I was the up and coming next rabbi. In my youth, everyone thought I had great potential. And then I was a Pharisee of the Pharisees. And if nobody who agreed with what I stood for, I persecuted, especially those who claimed the name of Christ. And I had them sentenced to jail. And I had them sentenced to death even. And I testified against them. And, and, I would, and it was my mission, my mission was to destroy the church of Christ. That was Saul of Tarsus' mission. To hurt the name of Christ, to persecute Christians, that was his mission. And then he speaks of his divine encounter on the Damascus Road. We're familiar with it. He had been given authority by the chief priests to go to Damascus, persecute the church there. And then look at verse 13, he says, At midday, O king, I saw in the way a light from heaven above the brightness of the sun shining round about me and them that journeyed with me can, can you hear the expression in his voice when you read that he says hey i'm on my way to damascus i'm getting ready to persecute the church i'm ready to haul, haul them back to jerusalem and have them stand trial i'm on my way to do that and then all of a sudden at midday O king at, at, when the sun is at its highest at the most brightest time of the day at midday O king there was a light that shone round about us. Not just me, but those that were with me. And then there was a voice from heaven that spoke unto me and said, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? It's hard for thee to kick against the pricks. He's telling this to Agrippa. And then Paul goes on to say, he asked them, who, who art thou, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus, whom thou persecutest. Well, why do you think he's telling him that it's Jesus whom thou persecutest? Why do you think Paul has to say that that's, that, that's who's speaking to him. Well, I kind of believe that King Agrippa was a little skeptical about the resurrection. No, he wouldn't have been able to speak to him had he not resurrected. <laughs> he wouldn't have been able to speak to him had he not resurrected. Hey, we wouldn't be here today if he had not resurrected. But he did resurrect, and we praise God for that. And then Paul speaks to Agrippa telling him, Hey, I was on the Damascus Road, and I had a mission. My mission was to destroy the church. My mission was to persecute Christians. My mission was to haul them in, into prison. But on that Damascus Road, he gave me a new mission. Look at verse 16. But rise and stand upon thy feet. This is Jesus speaking here. But rise and stand upon thy feet, for I have appeared unto thee for this purpose, to make thee a minister and a witness. Both of these things which thou hast seen and those things which I will appear unto thee. The Lord's telling Paul, Paul, your mission was to destroy my church. I have a new mission for you. Your purpose is to do this, to minister and to be a witness. That's it. That's your new mission. And what's going to be the results of that mission? Well, look at verse number 18. To open their eyes and to turn them from darkness to light. From the power of Satan unto God, that they may receive forgiveness of sins and inheritance among them which are sanctified by faith that is in me. Wow. I think we would all agree that God's purpose for Paul was a lot greater for Paul's purpose for his own life. Right. Certainly was. Hey, I'm so thankful that when the Lord gets a hold of a person's life, hey, he gives you a new purpose. He gives you a new life. He gives you a new purpose. Paul's new mission was to share that hope that had come into the world. Paul's new purpose was to share that hope that had come into the world. To share that hope so that people would do this, so that people would be, uh, uh, that they would no longer be spiritually blinded anymore. That they would turn from darkness unto light. To share the hope that offers the forgiveness of sins. That shares the hope that frees people from the power of Satan. Under the power of God. That, those are his words. And, and that, that his hope, uh, that his new purpose was to share the hope that offers an internal inheritance. Yeah. How? The last part of verse, five, verse 18. Look there. By faith that is in me. Hey church, salvation is by faith and in faith alone. Right. And in Jesus and in Jesus alone. And ever since the Damascus Road, the Apostle Paul has been nothing but faithful to his new mission. He's been nothing but faithful. He hasn't slacked. 
He hasn't gone lazy on it. Verse 19, he says, Whereupon, O King Agrippa, I was not disobedient unto the heavenly vision. And he was faithful to that mission, and he speaks about being faithful to that mission in Damascus and in Jerusalem and throughout the coast of Judea and unto the Gentiles, that he preached the gospel unto them. And basically, what Paul says to them is this, hey, this is why these are the charges that are being held against me. Why? Because I'm sharing the hope that had come. That's it. That was his case. He says, this is where I was as a youth. This is where I was as a Pharisee. I persecuted the church. I hurt the church. And then this is where I was when Jesus found me. And he gave me a new purpose. And he gave me a new plan. And he gave me a new mission. And ever since then, I've been nothing but faithful to that mission. And I preached to, to those at Jerusalem and Judea and even to the Gentiles. And, and, I, and I've been nothing but faithful unto them. And this is why I stand before you, Agrippa, in bonds. You know, Paul begins to summarize his defense in verse 22 and 23. He says, Having therefore obtained help of God, I continue unto this day witnessing both to small and great, saying none other things than those which the prophets and Moses did say should come. I, he, Paul says this, I was just being a witness to everyone. Didn't matter how great, didn't matter how small. I was being a witness to everyone. And really, Paul says, and you know, Agrippa, all I was saying is what Moses and the prophets had already said. Right. Paul, uh, uh, Paul saying, Agrippa, all I'm saying is I'm just repeating what the prophets said, and I'm just repeating what Moses said. Hey, Agrippa, aren't you an expert in the Old Testament? And then what did the prophets say? Look at verse... 23. <clears throat> that Christ should suffer and that he should be the first that should rise from the dead and should show light unto the people and unto the Gentiles. Yeah. You know, Paul says, Paul's telling them, hey, your hope has come. The hope has come already. The, your hope has come. Your hope has lived. Your hope has died, and your hope has resurrected, and your hope is already ascending on the right hand of the Father. Yeah. That's what your hope has done. And, and, and your hope offers the forgiveness of sins. He's saying, that's why I'm on trial. No, here's the thing. The religious leaders, they missed that hope had come, didn't they? They missed it. They didn't see that hope had come. Hey, at one point, Paul missed it. <laughs> at one point, Paul missed it as well. And, 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 but when Jesus got a hold of Paul's heart, he gave him a new purpose. And Paul's purpose is the same purpose for us today. And what's the purpose? That we should be willing to share with everyone that hope has come into the world. That's our purpose. Hey, as believers, each and every one of us have a purpose. And what's that purpose? To share the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's the purpose. That's the purpose. Hey, yes, yes, we're, we're all different. And yes, we all have different talents. And yes, we all might serve in different areas. And we all serve differently, that's for sure. But hey, but this is the thing. If you've received hope, if you've received the hope that brings the forgiveness of sins, if you've received the hope that removes your spiritual blindness, and if you've received the hope that freed you from the power of Satan and unto the power of God, if you've received that hope, if you've received the hope of acquiring a eternal inheritance, if you've received that hope, then here's the, th here's the thing, ladies and gentlemen, and here's the thing, church family, you have a purpose, and your purpose is this, to share that hope with everyone. That's your purpose. That's the purpose, to share hope. Hey, let me ask the question, what's the purpose of Calvary Baptist Church? What's the purpose of Calvary Baptist Church? Uh, okay, what's the purpose of what we do here? What's the purpose for, hit? What's the purpose for this? Well, what's the purpose for restarting our bus ministry? What's the purpose for that? What's the purpose of rebuilding our Sunday school classes? 
What's the purpose for that? What's the purpose for the nursery ministry? What's the purpose for the food bank? How many of you are thankful for the food bank? Yeah. Absolutely. What's the purpose for the food commodities? What's the purpose? And we could go on and on. Hey, what's the purpose for Saturday morning visitation? What's the purpose? Hey, I want to submit to you here this morning that the purpose should be this, that for people, for everyone to know that hope has come. That hope has come. Hey, you know why we should start, restart the bus ministry? Hey, because there's kids out there that don't know that hope has come. Hey, you know why we should start rebuilding the, our Sunday school classrooms? Hey, because there's young people out there and there's teenagers out there that don't know that hope has come. Hey, you know why that we should be considerate about the nursery ministry and volunteering? Because, hey, because there might be parents out there that are having a hard time controlling their kids in the pew, and they might miss out that hope has come. Right. Th that's a reality. Hey, you know why we should be a blessing with the food commodities in the food bank? Hey, so that might open the door so that somebody might come to know hope has come. Right. Yeah. You know, the world is so dark nowadays People might miss the fact that hope has come. No, 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 let me, let me say that again. The world is so dark nowadays, people might miss out and say, where's hope? Where is hope? Hey, the, the, the Pharisees and, and, and Paul at one point, they had missed that hope has come. Have you ever used your GPS and got lost using it? Yeah. I, I mean, you, you might be using your GPS and, and you're looking at your, your GPS and it says, Take this exit and in, in 5.5 miles, take exit 20, right? Okay, maybe I'm the only one with the GPS. Okay. And then it says, in five miles, take exit. In one mile, take exit. In half a mile, take exit. In a quarter mile, take exit. And it's like, right when you should be paying attention, you're not paying attention. And then all of a sudden, it's like, you're, you're, you're driving down the road and you're talking with somebody and then all of a sudden your GPS says, make U-turn. Oh, I missed it. I missed it. Hey, you know what happened? The Pharisees, they were so caught up in their own selves, they missed that hope has come. They missed their exit. Yeah. They missed it. And so you know what God did? God got a hold of Paul and got, got a hold of Peter and they had to tell them and say, hey, no, 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 no. You, you need to make a U-turn because hope has already come. Hope came, he lived, he died, he resurrected, he's ascended. Hope has come. Hope is in the Lord Jesus Christ. Hey, you know what, Pharisees? You missed it. Right. Hey, today we live in such a dark world, ladies and gentlemen, that people, they, they go searching for hope in all the, in all the wrong areas. They go searching for hope in all the wrong areas. Hey, people search for hope through drugs and alcohol. They do. That might be a surprise to you, but they do. They're looking for something to take the edge off. They're looking for something to help ease the pain a little bit. They're, they're looking for something to, to give them some sort of satisfaction. But unfortunately, when it's all done, there's nothing but regret and shame. And there's no hope there. Hey, people, they, they go looking for, for hope, and hey, they go looking for hope and for money. They think money could be their hope. Hey, is money necessary? Yes, money is necessary, and, and money in and of itself isn't necessarily evil, but this is the thing. We, all of us truly know that money and finances or building up your 401k, those things can never really give you joy like the one in true hope. Amen. None of those things can. And people, they go searching for hope in all the wrong areas. They go searching for hope in all the wrong places. Hey, you know what? You know what they need to know? They need to know hope is here. Right. People need to know where to be told where hope can be found. I believe God wants Calvary Baptist Church to be a soul-winning church. Yeah. I believe that. I believe that God wants Calvary Baptist Church to have its purpose to be a soul-winning church. I truly do. And I believe... Our members would say that Calvary, God wants Calvary Baptist Church to be a soul-winning church. But I'm not going to ask you the question if your church goes soul-winning. I'm not going to ask you that question. I'm going to ask you this question. Are you a soul-winner in your church? 
We're not going to ask you if your church goes soul winning. I want to ask you, are you a soul winner in the church? Hey, as a church, we gather. We gather. Hey, I praise God that we gather. There was a time when we didn't. There was a time where it was discouraging. There was a time when the media was awful. But hey, I'm, I'm thankful that we're able to gather. Hey, but, 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 but don't miss it. Don't miss it, church. I, I'm thankful for those who are here. I'm thankful for those who travel many, many, many miles just to be here. That, that just goes to show their appreciation and their desire to be faithful to gather. And so I'm thankful for the assembling of the saints. I really am. But, but know this. Let's not miss the purpose of our gathering. Because the purpose of our gathering isn't just for the sole purpose of gathering. No, the sole purpose of gathering is so that we go out. Are, are you following me? Are, 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 is this making sense? The sole purpose why we gather together is so that the purpose would be that we'd go out and take the gospel outside these walls of Calvary Baptist Church. I mean, just look, at, just look around. Hey, I'm, I'm, I'm thankful that we live in, a, in the city that we live in. And we don't have to, we don't have to deal with a, a lot of the corruption that takes place on the front range. And I praise God for that. But also, let us not be so naive that there is a lot of people in Sterling, Colorado that are still in spiritual darkness. There is still spiritual darkness taking place here in Colorado, and they are still looking for hope in all these different reasons. And the purpose of Calvary Baptist Church is that Calvary Baptist Church would be willing to take hope to a lost and dying world so that they might, so that, so that they might receive the blessing of hope, so that they might be relieved from the power of Satan and unto God, so that they might receive the forgiveness of sins, so that they too might receive the spiritual inheritance that you received when you accepted Jesus Christ as your personal Savior. Hey, hope has come. Sterling, Colorado needs hope, but it's the purpose of Calvary Baptist Church to take that message to them. It is. Hey, church, I'm sure each and every one of us, each and every one of us know somebody who has yet to receive Christ. Hey, as we celebrated the life of Brother Daniel last, just yesterday afternoon, hey, a young lady received Christ. Amen. She received hope, and we praise God for that. Hey, but there's still a lot more. There's still a lot more. There's still young people that still need to receive hope. There's still teenagers that need to receive hope. Hey, there's still coworkers in your office that need to receive hope. Hey, there's still people that you see on a regular basis that need to receive hope. And right now, they just need to know this. Hope has come, and hope could be offered unto them. And it's none other than the Lord Jesus Christ. Yeah. Are you willing to share that hope? Are you willing to share that hope? Hey, if Calvary Baptist Church is going to be a soul-winning church then we must be soul winners in the church. You must be a soul winner in the church. God wants us, this is our mission field. This is our mission field. Let's be willing to take hope to our mission field so that they know Jesus Christ as their Lord and personal Savior. Let's pray. Father,